Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to the Research Triangle PowerShell User Group. My name is Mike Kanakis, and on behalf of myself and Phil Bossman, we, we're so happy you could join us this evening. Tonight, we are very excited to have Fred Wyman from Microsoft joining us. He's going to be talking about his PS Azure Migration Advisor module, which helps bridge the gap for people who are struggling to figure out how to find code that they've written for Azure AD and migrate it to work with the new Microsoft Get Graft API. Fred is a guy with uh, a, a stellar background. Um, he's created some exemplary tools in the past, and we're so proud to have him presenting for us tonight. So first, let me say uh, welcome, Fred. I hope you're uh, ready to give us a good demo here. We're so happy you can join us. Mike, thank you for having me over. And don't worry, I've got everything prepped, including the demo gods. <laughs> I did tell some dirty jokes about them, so they are out for vengeance. Let's see how that works out for them. <laughs> All right. So um, I just like to give people a little intro so they know a little bit about who and what you are. So maybe you just want to tell people what you're doing in your current role and maybe some of the things you've done in the past uh, and what they might know you for in the community. Well, um, currently, the Microsoft's paying me to write code for customers. Uh, actually, they're Officially, I'm doing kind of infrastructure for people, but for some reason, all of these interesting PowerShell challenges end up on my desk. Might be somewhat involved with a little bit of advertising and telling to grab all the interesting bits before others get them. That's a different story. Uh, so I come traditionally from a, from an on-prem background, uh, but with Microsoft, that means lots of Azure anyway. And, uh, since I, my, my primary skill is PowerShell and it's viable with lots of products, I'm all over the field. There is what the hell do you manage today, Fred? <laughs> um, so my uh, what I really like to do is optimizing all my coding workflows, my, my coding tooling to produce better code cheaper, which is where the PS Framework project comes in. So if you're looking to make your coding life easier, I recommend visiting that project website. We've got quite a few things documented. It's a tip of the iceberg kind of thing, but uh, the tip will get you far already. Uh, also, Active Directory keeps being one of my, house, uh, um, one of my household products. Uh, uh, well, I also have a major management project under one if you're looking into changing the way you manage your entire Active Directory. Before that, um, I was a freelance consultant. Before that, I worked for a small IT services provider. My real career in uh, changing transformative experience really was joining the community actively uh, shortly after going freelance consultant. So my main my first real step into the public stage was the DBA tools project. This was actually one, probably one of the uh, one of the cheapest. Uh, hires uh, that ever happened because I was hired onto the project with one smiley. Crystal well, Lemaire, the project owner, um, followed a pull request of mine and reacted to that with a smiley that got me curious. I looked up who the hell was that. And well, there was this interesting project that I just had to help out and just happened to have a little bit of time that started me on into all the conferences and act actually really reaching out to people it had a people engaging with the community that totally transformed the level of my code. And at the same time, it got me noticed and hired with Microsoft. So it was uh, a real extreme career enhancer, actually doing uh, free labor uh, in the community and having fun with fellow minded folks. And, and this, is, this is kind of what we always tell people about being active in the community is that uh, the PowerShell community is one of those communities that really loves to see people succeed. And the people that put the time and the effort in to develop code, share code, interact with people that are writing code, uh, and just be active in the community in general, seem to fall into really good positions in the community. Fred is another one that can attest to that. So um, we're going to get Fred started on his talk here, but if you're watching this from home on YouTube, and you wonder about the PowerShell community, come and join our group, um, get involved, find the PowerShell community on Twitter, PowerShell.org, the Slack and Discord forums. It's a community that really wants people to be successful. And when the time is invested, there's really great things that comes out for the people that put the time in. So with that, we'll hand it over to Fred. Thanks again for doing this tonight, Fred, and really looking forward to uh, watching this demo. All right. 
In that case, this is one of the latest uh, projects that I uh, got hired to do for a customer. And one of the great things with my frequent customers is that they actually allow me to publish the code, share it with the community. It's one of the things I really look out for in projects. And this customer, they've got a large, large code base, and they actually don't know how large because there is no central way to gather that information. And they are using a lot of Azure Active Directory uh, for all of the workers because they have been doing a massive push into the cloud. We're talking about six digit employees, really large corporation, and they have a huge footprint. And well, the thing to use in uh, PowerShell when you want to interact with uh, Azure Active Directory that's usually been the Azure AD module or the MS Online module. Now, there was this recent news, well, actually not all that recent, but it has somehow gone, un gone unnoticed by quite a few departments, is that all of these old modules, spe specifically Azure AD and MS Online, are being deprecated. They are going to stop working. Previously, this, the deadline was June 30th. It has been pushed back to December this year but these modules, they're going to go. There is a new option with the Microsoft Graph. There are uh, new commandlets for that, so you don't have to implement your REST API calls manually, mostly. There might be situations where you want to do that anyway, but there is a toolkit available. So there is like kind of a migration option. There is a list on the internet on docs.microsoft.com which previous command maps to which new command. The list isn't perfect. The commands don't always match one to one. And unfortunately, it is not something you can just, you know, rename and you're done. So there is no reasonable way to automate the entire migration. But this large customer, they wanted to know what code do we need to uh, manage? I mean, we have got probably tens of thousands of PowerShell scripts that interact with Azure Active Directory, or that might interact with Azure Active Directory. So we now need a way to figure out where do we need to invest time? What do we need to fix? What do we maybe not need to fix? And well, that's where this tool comes in. The PS Azure Migration Advisor is a PowerShell project designed to well, eat some scripts and tell you which line and which script you need to uh, you need to change and what you probably want to change it to. Now, seeing is believing, this is a lot easier if I just you know show you a simple example and get this whole thing rolling. First of all, I grabbed some random script from the internet that happened to have the correct license notifications, so I can use it for a demo and has lots of Azure AD commands that are all going to die. None of these commands is going to survive this year. They need to go. So Fred, let me interrupt you for one second. So I just want to talk like high level about what you're doing here. Like when a customer comes to you with this idea or asks, you know, can you help us figure out how to get from A to Z? So I understand the concept of what you want to do and I probably am going to be pretty amazed at what you built, but how did you kind of, could you speak a little bit about like, how did you go about thinking like, how the hell am I going to find, take this command and match it up to the appropriate command? Like other than building some sort of mapping, I would think, how would you know, like get a user is equal to get MG user, uh, you know, how you know how you put that all together? I'm I'm so curious about like actually that wise. Is, how does it is, work? That is something that was extremely simple. Fortunately, somebody else did the legwork and posted a table on docs.microsoft.com, which I then scrapped into something that is actually usable. That ah, was the so there was point. so there was some pre work done that you were able to leverage that said here's a relation of of commands yep. and I just need to validate that they're correct. And then I can look for these commands and I can then present this command as probably the uh, alternative command that they'll need to use. Exactly. I ah. built that I built that entire app, that entire data set, put it on GitHub in a way that the tool can can ingest. I'll be looking at that later on. And um, 
it's designed so uh, the community can add their own intellig for in the intelligence and no notes to any, any single conversion. So, for example, uh, if you know that matching this command to that command is technically correct, but it doesn't quite do everything you need to do, uh, to do X, Y, Z in order to make things work, you can contribute that knowledge to that part. Until then, it's just that you'll probably want to use that command instead and look at the docs to get that working. We do have some, some first uh, uh, additions already. Happy to any contribution from anybody there. We'll be showing how that looks where it is and why it isn't scary at all. But first, let's take a look at what the tool will, will do right now with the data we already got from that table. And what I do is I pipe one file, 100 files, 1,000 files to the read AC script file command. And that's already it. Then I have for each line where something happens and what is the corresponding command in, on the other side. There is a few, uh, there are a few more extra information messages sometimes when we have extra intelligence to offer. But this is not really the ideal way to view it. I hate to say it, PowerShell is not always the ideal, perfect information displaying tool out there. It is excellent if you want to manipulate it, but it, if you want to, like, like this is the checklist you want to process, I usually prefer having something a bit more visual and the output is kind of optimized to work with that. So let's go ahead and export this to Excel. Um, now, if you don't know export Excel, uh, this is from the PowerShell module called import Excel which uh, allows you to generate Excel files without needing to have Excel installed. Very useful on servers. It does have the advantage over CSV that it maintains uh, uh, data types like numbers and also is highly convenient from a, from a displaying perspective because you can do, with the module, you can do everything. If you need to auto generate pivot tables for your management report, Import actually has you covered. Now, another command, very convenient, keep in mind, is invoke item because invoke item opens the path you feed it in the default application for that. And there we go. This is now the result of your scan. You can now see what would it be the before, what would be the after, including parameters. And you can add intelligence of renaming a parameter if that is applicable. And we do have one information for get mg user that actually the all parameter is now a switch type, so we can no longer actually provide a value here. It's uh, so simple. It's like really. It's brilliant because you walk through each line and say, hey, there's a specific line here that's got a command. You're going to have to go to this line and replace this. And I think I heard you just say you can actually have the, the module replace the commandlet for you if you wanted to. No, oh, totally. It's just oh, risky because it generally wouldn't work afterwards because you need to change parameters. But sure. if you want to do the uh, rename that works uh, just as well. And that is convert AC script file. You get a warning. Uh, are you really sure you want to do this? You probably will still need to keep things in mind. And before I actually go ahead and do that, let's create a copy um, of that. So we do have the original also in the docs, if you later want to access that on GitHub. And then, uh, yep, I'm really, really sure I want to risk my soul and eternal happiness. <laughs> and there we go, update MG user, get MG user, 
get mg subscribed the SKU. All updated. So just as a sort of scope of work tool, a, a customer can take 500 scripts, pipe them at that one command, get a list out of almost every place that they're going to need to touch a file to make a change. They can have the script do the work for them if they so inclined to do so. But if they really want to be cautious and they want to do a manual conversion by hand, you basically now have almost like a, a script for people to follow to say, here's where you're going to have to go. These are all commandlets that we know are going to need to be updated. And it comes out with a list of a statement of work that needs to be done based on the scope of the amount of scripts that you have. It's like so simple and brilliant. It's really, it's, I look no. at it and I said, God damn, that's so great. Now, the next thing that's coming out, and we're talking about probably by the end of this week, I need to resolve one technical block and the rest is already covered, is something like this. Let's be honest here. ADS PowerShell file read lazy script file. This is going to scan your entire Azure DevOps organization, searching every single PowerShell file and applying the same search to them. That's awesome. It's limited by the access rights of the user. You can only scan projects that you have read access to, but if you are logged in as a global Azure DevOps admin of the organization, you can just pipe that through and you get every single PowerShell script in your entire DevOps organization and scan it. I can already tell you right now, the convert will not work. But you can easily just, once you have the repository, uh, you can use the same module to clone it down, bulk convert your local clone, commit, push, and you're done. So let, me point more? Out, let, me, let me point out something here that people may not realize when they see this. So Fred mentioned about five minutes ago, the export uh, import Excel module. Um, it's a module I'm very fond of. It's one of three modules that I automatically install on every machine I work on. Um, when you are a guy that does PowerShell in your organization and you bring some of these open source tools into your organization and you leverage Fred's module here and you say, hey, boss, you know, I don't know if you heard, but Microsoft's going to be deprecating the Azure AD API. And I don't know if you know what that means, but every script that we've written for the last three years is going to break. And we're going to have to re up, we're going to have to update all those scripts and point them to a new API. And oh, by the way, the new API has all new commandlet names. So we're going to have to go through and hand touch every file and find all those things. And as Fred said earlier, some orgs have thousands or tens of thousands of scripts. Now, here you do is you take Fred's work, right, that he so generously releases to the community, and you walk in with this module, much like import Excel, when I export my AD reports and I give the, the manager who asked for a report this nice fancy Excel spreadsheet with formatting and titles and row colors and tab names, all this stuff, they go, oh my God, that guy really knows how to do stuff. It's just because you know how to use open source tools. This is gonna be the same exact thing. You're going to walk in on a Monday or a Tuesday and you're going to say, you know what, I, I got this tool that I think can help us. And you're going to now run this command that he's got here on line 28. And you're going to go out and you're going to scan the whole thing and you're going to get back 
an Excel report with like 72 tabs for every script that you have. And you say, okay, guys, I figured out every piece of code that we have to change. The people in your organization are going to look at you like you're a genius. And they're not going to know that some guy named Fred Wyman enabled you to do this great work by figuring how to do this. So these are the opportunities that you can take from this community, find these really cool tools, bring them into your organization, and make you stand out for what you were able to do to help your organization. This has happened to me at least four or five times in my organization. Just because I know what's happening in the open source community and I can take some of those tools back to work and they see the results and people go, oh my God, this guy's a genius. Well, I, I'm not a genius. I just knew about a tool that was available to make my life easier. This is gonna be one of those tools for many, many people over the next few months. This is amazing. And I'm very looking for, much looking forward to see that. Uh, by the way, the tooling for the Azure DevOps commands, this is another spin-off of another project I got to wrote and publish uh, for another project um, because I basically am auto-generating the entire Azure DevOps module. We're, talk, we're talking about more than 800 commands being auto-generated in a powerful user-friendly manner. I found that you have the Swagger files where the definition is on how looks how does the API look, and I've got a tool that will convert that into PowerShell functions for me. That is actually very user friendly to convert. We already had that tooling uh, in the form of Autorest. The official graph model is generated from that, but the official Autorest tooling has the problem of size. It generates the sharp based modules with lots of overhead. So the entire graph modules together are about one gigabyte of storage only for the module files. With uh, my tooling implementing the clients for the entire graph API was 50 megabytes, help included. And the same I'm using for Azure DevOps. So uh, the Azure DevOps service is going to receive a new uh, toolkit soonish. As in, probably on uh, on Friday, being honest, I do hope to get that problem resolved by tomorrow, but not promising that before I actually have that finished. Anyway, once that is done, um, the thing with the migration is that uh, it's not just that you need new command lots. You also need new permissions for your app registration. And you connect to Azure AD, you as a need to define like what scopes, what permissions do I need for my script to run? And the old Azure AD API has different permissions than the new API, the graph API. Now, theoretically, you could uh, just convert the scopes on a one-to-one -one basis by being rather permissive about what you grant on the destination side, just to be sure nothing breaks. You can do that, but you might end up with a lot of tenant read all permissions, which we generally try not to do. So um, I'm going to be building uh, another data set. What uh, scopes does which graph command need? And of that, we can then uh, scan a script and tell you you will need to assign ex exactly these scopes in order for the script to run. That's uh, the next to do for that particular customer. So I would expect that someone next month to ship. In the meantime, let's take a look at where the hell does that data live? You mentioned, uh, you, you asked about uh, how does my module know which Azure AD command is which graph command? Now let's see about that on GitHub. It's in here in the GitHub repository for PS Azure Migration Advisor. You can find it under data. And then for each module and each command, you can find the appropriate entry. So let's go with to get Azure AD user. And that's the mapping. Got one entry for the current name, the new name, any parameters that uh, you need to re that that you want to remap. 
this is used and respected when you uh, do the convert command. So it will rename object ID to user ID and search string to search. And uh, it will generate errors for every single uh, parameter that it finds here if the parameter is in use on this, uh, in the script. Which is uh, the exact error message that we got when we opened that, that up in Excel. This one. So if you know something I don't, just add the information here. We also have the ability to just add a description or uh, information message uh, for the command itself, not just for the parameters. So you can add an additional intelligence there. Actually, I remember a recent history. Um, remove Azure AD group owner. That one is a good example for that. Mm -hmm. Azure AD group owner. This one has a problem. You see, uh, for that command, there is no corresponding graph command. However, there is an uh, API call for that. They can custom call. There's no command for it, but you can do invoke uh, MG graph request to call it anyway. And in that those instances, we also in try to include the link to the documentation that describes how that would look like. So you can then. <coughs> Check out how that exact call would be working. So Fred, I don't want to put you on the spot because I know you're a Microsoft employee, but um, what are your thoughts on when Microsoft puts people in this situation where the MSLL module goes away or the Azure AD module goes away and the replacement tool doesn't contain all the same functionality as the tools that they're taking away? I mean, I understand what you're saying, it's a graph call, but the thing that frustrates me as a customer is like, if you come from a sysadmin background and you didn't grow up on code, calling REST APIs and ingesting JSON and doing all this, that's not everyday sysadmin work. And they're making some of these things that had an easy command to use, something that's much, got a, a much higher bar of entry for an everyday, uh, uh, admin that isn't well versed with code. I fully agree with you there, and that is in fact the reason that the um, cut over time has been extended. Why oh. we extended it from June to December because the new tooling wasn't ready yet with sufficient time buffer to give you the time to actually do the switch for those commands. Ah, uh, so do you think like those missing commands, like the one you just pointed out, at some point will make up? Uh, will make the way into the module. They'll, Absolutely. They'll, they'll come around. If they don't, we'll get another extension. We, we'll, we cannot, literally cannot, by management fired, kill the old API before the new tooling is fully implemented. Yeah, because I, I mean, I've talked with a couple of the guys in the group that do a lot of Azure stuff, and it's just, it's frustrating to have to have three modules running because not all three modules have the same commandlets. So to do your normal work, you have to jump between MSOL, Azure AD, the Azure module, and now the graph module. It would be great if there was just one set of tools. So I, if you're saying they're gonna get there, that's great to hear. My my gut tells me is, is that the December deadline that they're talking about will probably be pushed back again. Um, they don't wanna say that now, but I'm sure there'll be enough people that will make some noise that'll probably cause them to push it back some more. We will uh, see about that. I cannot confirm or deny. I have uh, my own suspicions on that. And you mentioned earlier about the auto rest stuff and the overhead that it builds. Um, do you like the direction Microsoft is going by using auto rest to build these modules? Um, yes and no. Uh, no, I would prefer them to be handcrafted if it were possible. So I know I, on a, from a technical um, quality perspective, I would say, uh, please stop using auto rest, build them by hand, do it right, and everybody uh, profits. 
The problem is we literally do not have the manpower that has the necessary skills that to do this. And and that's what I've heard um, when I'm on some of the MVP calls and you get to talk to some of the program managers. Their their argument is that even though the auto rest doesn't create as great a module as if we did it by hand, we've been able to produce many more modules or or much more code that covers all the commandlets. Uh, the the backlog is going down for the amount of work that still needs to be produced. So I just wish there was a little bit more detail in the auto rest modules. It's it's sometimes thin to find what you need. Yeah. Um, the documentation quality can differ. There are some very, very excellent examples. There are some that are less fair. I've found that myself when I implemented my own auto rest uh, uh, client to generate the script version of that, not the C-sharp version. Um, one of the things where I believe we need to push and what the, where the discussion is going, but uh, it's um, a bit complicated on a tech perspective. Uh, I believe we need to make all the rest as it is more accessible for people to modify uh, the output in a way that the result is more powerful user friendly. Currently, uh, when you look at, for example, the graph modules uh, at the repository, um, yeah, they generate uh, they generate the, uh, the output, but have you ever considered trying to contribute some kind of fix and improvement for for some of the other things? You can modify the output in the pipeline by updating by doing a pull request uh, correctly with all the configuration files and right. It's just not accessible to somebody who is an average publisher person. And I believe if we can improve that. That would, for example, uh, improve my ability to contribute to, to the code quality. I mean, this, uh, the, the, the same is true for, for, this and for example, the customer engineer uh, environment. We don't have all that many deep dive PowerShell developers that can actually invest the time to understand how Autorest is working and how to improve the output. Yeah, some of us, some of us on this call were having a conversation about this two or three days ago and sort of lamenting the fact that PowerShell doesn't seem to be a uh, uh, first-rate client in the Azure world uh, compared to the uh, AZ CLI or maybe Python or some of these other languages. I, I don't know if you've ever seen James O'Neill's uh, Graph++ module, and you see what can be built when it's done by hand with someone who actually knows PowerShell really well. I mean, his module just is able to pipe things together and make such convenience of a lot of different areas of Azure. And when you see what could be done, it is a little disheartening to see what we're getting. But I mean, I sort of understand it. I just I just hope that the, the, the drive and the support for PowerShell stays there within Azure. It really makes our lives easier. Modules like this that you're producing really help us do our job. Um, but from the people that I talk to and some of the stuff that we get churned out, it doesn't always seem like PowerShell is that well known with the devs. They don't know how to write for PowerShell that well. Yeah, it's um, difficult uh, skills to hire into the dev teams. And I didn't, building, I didn't, building, it up, building it up has been a historic issue. I am involved in our internal training program that that's concerned, uh, including having quite a few recordings by now to get help people get started, but um, it's still a struggle. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I, am, I am sort of hopeful. I've noticed Microsoft has been grabbing a lot of community people for various roles on the PowerShell team and the Azure team, on the Docs team. So they're, they're putting a good base of people in some important positions. Um, but I don't know how much is happening behind the scenes on the Azure side, but um, I didn't mean to derail your presentation. It's just, so I just was curious your take on it as coming from the community and now being Microsoft employee. Um, well, PowerShell I, in Azure definitely leaves a little to be desired. Yep. Um, on the other hand, being on the inside gives me the ability to actually do something about quite a few of these options. 
Mm -hmm. For example, something that is going to be released soon. I'm not quite. We're not quite sure whether it's going to be official docs or it's just a uh, major blog post. But I have finished writing down the entire implementation guide for Azure Functions Modern Authentication for PowerShell. To add something at least in that scene that's been kind of neglected for some time. Like how can you create your own custom scopes? How can you validate on each function endpoint whether the user is actually done, not just you know authenticated with a token? So you can actually implement uh, just enough administration in Azure Functions. That's really cool stuff. Anyway, we're not quite done yet, so let's move on. I'm going to just take back the take over the show back again. Sure, I'm sorry and, to derail you there. It's just something uh, I wanted to totally bring no up. Worries. I always love the I love the interaction and interest. So. I always have you about questions. By the way, I think I forgot to mention that I am stuck with a single screen. So, uh, any questions outside? And if you don't speak up, I will have no idea. I don't have access to the chat or anything like that. So, somebody um, please speak up. The question there is up. one question here that I, I didn't look at yet. Uh, Robert wants to know how about up, and this was five minutes ago. So, hopefully, it's relevant to what we were talking about. How about updating per user MFA settings in the graph module? That never made it from MSOL to Azure AD, and it's not in the graph the last I checked. I know you can get the registered methods, but you cannot enable, enforce, disable it in any module other than MSOL. Um, I so believe, he's basically, he I wants believe to interact with the MFA for, settings. I believe there was uh, that option in the preview, uh, in the beta endpoint of the graph by now. But I would have to look down, and I cannot say I'm 100% certain. Okay. So it sounds like that's uh, probably in the pipeline coming soon. And then Andy wanted to know if you have any idea if get MSOL, MSOL partner contract will be replaced. It's the only one giving errors in his script library right now. Uh can't say I know, but I do have a list of the currently published mapping data. Get MSOL uh, partner data. Partner contract, yeah. Partner contract, there we go. Yeah. Uh, nope, we don't have it on uh, mapping for that. Okay, so hopeful that it's coming in the future uh, as they develop more. As so, mentioned, so they can't shut down MSOL online before that is mapped. So it sounds to me, <clears throat> it sounds to me, like Microsoft made a conscious decision, and I don't know this to be true, but to say, let's go through and let's hit the commandlets that we know people use the most, get those working so people can get started, and then we'll keep backfilling on all the commandlets, but some of them just don't have the usage that get Azure AD user does or get mailbox or something like that. So let's get those out of the way first and let's come back and fill in the gaps. So for people watching um. at home, we have to be I, hopeful that more is coming. Uh, actually, as from what I've seen in the code implementation for those endpoints, they are verified that we actually have the graph API endpoint. We just don't have a command that. Uh, they were fairly unique in how they were uh, how they were being called. So it might be that the auto rest uh, definition uh, is the bottleneck here on the, on the auto rest client on um, being able to generate that. On uh, those that don't even have a graph API endpoint, I can say, I can say so far I've always found an API endpoint, but I must admit I did not go actively hunt every single not not web command. I did not have the time for that. So if if you find a command there that has a new command, but you know the endpoint for the graph a graph API call to do it instead, that too is very valuable information to update it. So we have more than just a warning. Is that just an error? Oh, sorry, we don't have a we don't have any counterparts yet. So we can at least offer an API call in the meantime for this particular project. As mentioned, we can't really shut down the API before that is somehow available on the other side. Okay. All right. So, so you think it may just be a limitation of the auto rest code generator doesn't know what to do with that endpoint. Uh, yeah. it, uh, at least some of those, uh, I expect them to be exactly that. I can also very well uh, 
uh, I'm also very happy to assume that some of those are literally not yet available at the new API or are still in the beta and not on the 1.0 endpoint for graph, which uh, might also put on a limitation there. Okay. All right. Now, the thing with me about um, writing uh, modules that do a lot of meta coding, like PS Azure Migration Advisor, is that I do kind of uh, am a friend of short mercenaries, uh, maxims of a maximally effective mercenary. There is no kill. Uh, there's no kill like overkill. Um, so, hey, I need some some interaction with the parser. I need to go through that whole thing. Why not set up a full framework, extensible plugin, uh, plugin based framework for scanning code and refactoring code. So I don't have to reinvent the wheel every single time I need to mess with the code itself. This is where the actual module refactor comes in, which is the framework on top of which PS Azure Migration Advisor actually lives. Refactor is a fun little command that is designed, a module that is designed to accept as, um, accept the toolkit to parse code and generate tokens from that, something that represents whatever you're looking for, whether it's a command, whether it's a variable, whether it's whatever, and uh, then do something with that. Apply some transformation rules like renaming or just generating warnings. So let's take a look at the tools and a short example of what, how that looks in the field. We do have um, a lot of various items in there, but the first in P1 is the, um, for the purposes of the migration visor, is the uh, read script command command. Let's take a look at what the code looks like here. This is a script file that we are now going to parse. By default, currently Refactor comes with one scanning component, one plugin, and that is searching for commands, which is what we're using in PS Azure Migration Advisor to uh, well, search for all of the commands that we need to migrate. And well, we do have a few commands in here from get AC context to um, over get AC user, AC AD user import CSV of something that is probably possibly going to work. This there is not going to go well, but who cares? Uh, some splatting going on here, which is going to complicate our scanning, and some uh, line breaks here, just to see whether our scan can handle all that. So we do have something to scan. Let's. Try scanning it and see what it will tell us. You can see here all the individual commands that were found in the script in the same order. The next iteration is going to, uh, ha instead of having the start offset, which is relative to the start of the string of the entire file, uh, we're going to switch to line because line is uh, obviously something the user would be more interested in. Okay, now let's see what do we have here. We do have the um, get Azure AD application command with no parameters, which is correct. For set Azure AD application, we just detect both parameters, including the one after the line break. So. Obviously, the backtick is nothing that will hinder us here. What we also have is for the dirt command, it knows these three parameters. So the scanner actually understands splatting and tries to figure out where the hell is this hash table being defined and what keys do we know we have. which is what we added then here in the list of parameters found. 
which we can then use in the PS Azure Migration Advisor to uh, generate warnings and alerts and information and, re and renaming of parameters based on uh, what he detected here. So effectively, this tool for refactor is basically just using the AST to, to basically inspect your code. Right. And then uh, the next part, which we'll be looking at after we're done with this, uh, this particular point, uh, is how do we define um, a transformation? How do we want to rename something and how that would, would look? Okay. So, so it, it, you can use this beyond that, just to even kind of inspect your code and like, hey, is anybody using some module kind of thing? And so you can run even just refactor on it to go find, hey, is anybody using, you're talking in the Azure stuff, but you know, I'm, I live in a Citrix world. I'm like, hey, is anybody using this mod, this commandlet in this mod, anywhere in, you know, this entire block of code? Is anybody using, you know? Yep, like and which parameters are they using? Yeah, parameters too, but we'd even just like go find, you know, how is it? Yeah, actually, I like that. All right. It's really accessible. Going a big further, a bit further down to set a trade user, this one is a bit more complicated. We detect obviously UPN uh, or object ID as parameter. However, we also detect country, company name, and foo because we already know that those are inside of the param. Um, hash table. However, we also pick up on employee ID from those two, and we also picked up mail nickname, which is only uh, visible uh, used here in the add method call. We do not, however, know what is in dollar properties or in dollar property. What exactly are we adding here? So this is where the param known issue comes in. In the case of the dir command, we know absolutely which parameters are we binding. There is no ambiguity there. In the case of set ID user, these are the parameters we know are being used, but there might be others that we cannot resolve. This becomes more important in a later feature where you're getting the absolute uh, Premier demonstration because I literally finished that half an hour uh, or finished something uh, demonstratable half an hour before the user group meeting started. So we are now good to go and we can try to change things in that script. For that, I'm going to create a copy so we keep the original and the materials. And then let's take a look at how would we tell it to be something else. And that is that we need to load a transformation file or token transformation set. It's a bloody technical term. I probably should have picked a different name. Let's call up that, that, and there we go. First of all, at the top level, we have a version specification at the type of token that we want to transform in this case, command. Uh, what I'm currently working on is, for example, another kind of another plugin that doesn't scan for commands, but instead sc instead scans for help or scans for variables. This is another one that's probably gonna ship by default. Anyway, for command, we do have uh, for the command set a trade user, the old name, the new name. We have parameters that we can rename, and we can specify some messages as part of the transformation in case we want to include some well, information as part of the refactor. This whole thing has uh, a lot of options. I do have a sample um, file with all of the options documented. This file is also in the repository, so you can look that up on GitHub. And this is the exact same data that we provide here in the commands for MS Online and Azure AD. Perfect time for the mouse to decide not to work anymore. Thank you, mouse. Business. These entries, they map one to one to these values. Because that's just behind the scenes, we're providing a transformation file to the scan engine and just tell it. 
I want all of the Azure AD commands. And this would be the new name and then process the scanning part, the component. So with these commands, we can now, let's focus on set Azure AD user, rename some parameters and write some more information. First, we load the definition. And then we pipe it to convert convert a script file. And with the dash backup parameter, we are creating a backup before saving the file. So we do have the original. Show that. Let's open it up here. We do have now a demo backup, which is the original code. Unchanged. On the other side, the uh, demo file has now been renamed. And you can see we even went into the hash table definition or into the method call and updated the parameters that we renamed. That's super or, cool. And this case, uh, the backticks are, are uh, dying. The parser does not really recognize the backticks as an item. So the backtick line break is that after we do the migration, but it also renamed the parameters here because they're defined somewhere else in that list. Public line to public. But that's not quite all. We do have a few extra informations, messages that we want to generate. And this is the actual scan result that we're getting because every single item that we run the convert through returns an object on how that whole thing went. Was it successful? How many changes did we apply? Did we get any messages? And then we can check out every single message that was being generated and exactly where it happened and how. So you can have success in renaming something. You can fail it for some reason. You might want to just include some information, which would then be visible in a um, scan result without saving a file. If you just want to scan it and get some information out of that of your command usage. And of course, we have the individual entries, the individual changes that we applied with lots of metadata that allows us to dig down, uh, dig deep into the details on how the whole thing went. Well, and with that, I can now scan for any command of any module that I care to know about. So I could just as well do a PS Citrix migration advisor if they get a new version and I need to remap some things. It's basically just a configuration overhead, a lightweight one that handles the execution yeah now um there's a new feature that is added to the pipeline to the system and that is scanning for breaking changes which very soon the ps azure migration advisor will also include where you can um, scan your script base to what would break if i update the az modules from 5.0 to 7.0 For that, let's so take a look. In that, in that case, when you're doing that, you need to know what would break. Like you need to right. have some metadata. You so would somebody, need to, somebody yeah. needs to provide that data. We do have that data in written form for the Azure modules. They've got that on the docs.microsoft.com for every single for every single like my, uh, version change. What uh, would break? The definition of breaking is a bit. Um, Less intuitive because this is again something written by C Sharp developers. So renaming the output type is obviously a breaking change, which is something most of us our PowerShell scripts are not going to be terribly unhappy about. We don't usually care about type names. Sometimes yes, but mostly not. So I'm going to. Uh, I've got some features implemented to help that. Um, you can tag breaking changes. So there's a, we can do a strict mode and a lenient mode for scanning. But let's take a simple, take a look at a simple implementation. We've got a PowerShell module called fridge, which includes a few very business critical commands. 
Now, this script we need to scan because somebody is updating the fridge module version. And we know this script actually uses uh, version 1.0. And by now, we do have a few updates. So somebody went ahead and provided that information for the module fridge. For example, in version 2, we had a breaking change with get beer, which had a complete rewrite, and we just need to completely readjust that. In version 2.1.0, we um, added parameter, uh, had some breaking changes in these two parameters. And uh, the remove beer command obviously was a bad idea. So uh, we kind of made away with that. So how do we do that? First of all, we uh, import the breaking change from PSD1 file. And then we search for the breaking change in that path for the module fridge. And we do a migration from version 1.0.0 .0 .0 to the version 1.0.1. And since all the breaking changes started happening with, with version two, that wasn't all that horrible. So let's see what happens here. Nothing yet. But version 2.0.0, that one could actually see some mileage. Did I mess up anything here? We did import the breaking changes, so uh, I'm a fool. OK, we already knew that, um, but now I extra know that. I should be scanning the correct file. That one, as expected. And this one has two breaking changes, because we use get beer twice. Doing the same with a scan with a migration to version three. We now have additional breaking change information. And that information, of course, includes additional data. I'm just not showing quite everything because um, it's not all that interesting in all cases. So let's grab second one and give us a format list version. So we can see in which version was the uh, breaking change implemented. And uh, yeah, what else? Um, the module it's assigned to is here. Because we can search for multiple modules. And that works like that. And with that uh, notation, I can have multiple modules with different version uh, increments, like different AZ modules that have separate version tracking, and still get the same results. So this is going to ship tomorrow in Refactor, once I've written the help properly and done some documentation. And a PS Azure Migration Advisor is going to receive that for the AZ modules probably on Friday. And yes, this tool too also works with Azure DevOps once that part is done. So we can do the version migration scan for, entire, uh, for an entire organization in Azure DevOps.
I like it. I like it a lot. So that then the the in this case, Microsoft is going to you know typically publishes the breaking change work, like so that BSD one um, would need to be then developed in that form of like you know you'd have to know where those breaking now Microsoft is doing that, but you know, yeah, if you're trying yeah. to do this other you know even your internal stuff, you'd have to know those that those kind of breaking changes are coming, and then the developers would be you know architecting or you'd have to then architect that file. Exactly. But for example, I will most certainly for those few modules where I accept a breaking change, I will start uh, maintaining such a definition file as here to track which breaking changes are. The tool can ingest it, and anybody else can automatically scan that as well with their own tooling without needing my scanning tool if they want to integrate that information data into their own workflows. I've been um, annoying Damien Caro, owner of the Azure command lines, so that there might be a chance that I'll be able to uh, outsource the definition of that file for the for future Azure modules. So I don't have to manage that manually since they need to track that information anyway. So um, it's going to be in piece Azure Migration Advisor for all of the AZ modules for at least the latest few versions. And it's available to any other module out there. Yeah. Somebody mentioned in chat about, um, I guess, the read AZ script only processes uh, PS1 and PSM ones. Um, can can it also be added to uh, su uh, support PSFs, which is the PowerShell forms? Um, I can modify the file extension filter. Yes, not a problem. If it needs special reading to access the code, um, I need to look at the format. I honestly don't work too much with user interfaces, so I am not conversant with that. Whether it's just the file extension name for the sake of it, or whether there's actually a format change in there. Yeah, I think it's just a, a PowerShell, and it's just known that way because it's consumed by PowerShell Studio. I think so, I'm pretty sure. But uh, maybe Carlos can offer some insights. Um, yeah, it's plain text. All right, in that case, that should not be a problem. But it's their yeah. own format, but it, you can just rename it as a PS1 and it'll just run right. Yeah, if it's uh, uh, if it's uh, if it's plain text PowerShell script legitimate, we don't need to rename any, anything. Yeah, no, I just I just modified your code to include that file extension, and it processed it fine with no problem. Excellent. Uh, in that case, um, I'll update it or uh, do a pull request. Either will work for me. I'm happy to include that. Just in case anybody else needs to or anyone who creates using PowerShell Studio any forms. Right. All right. That uh, covers the uh, high level functionality and feature plan and lots of conversation around that. Uh, how are we looking time wise? I think I already exceeded all the expected uh, time ranges. I think you so know, good. we don't really have a, a time limit. That's up to you. If you think you've covered enough, we don't want to kill you. But if you want to keep going, we're more than happy to watch. Um, in that case, I will just close it off with a quick look at the plugin. I definitely don't have the capacity anymore uh, to do a full AST uh, explanation and demonstration on how that works. Uh, sorry for those who look, were looking forward to AST. I'll be happy to uh, pick it up again at another date. You will find if you don't know me yet that it's never a prop to get me about to to get me to bragging. So that's always on the table. Now let's see. Um, to provide a command. So there we are. Now fundamentally, what I we provide for a token provider for one of those parsing and transformation logic pieces. We need to provide the name 
the uh, index property that we're using to, to match token to, um, to transform file. And uh, the parameters that we accept. For example, the uh, which message files uh, are supported in our transformation file. So if we look at the command transform, these uh, settings, which of these we do we support is defined in this list. And then the only real thing is we need a tokenizer and a converter. Tokenizer is the scanning logic and converter then reacts to things, adds a message to items and returns the whole thing or um, re it provides the rename by adding changes, which involves a lot of AST uh, voodoo to make that happen with the, all the splatting. The splatting really uh, made this code a lot less um, readable than it could have been otherwise. But for example, this one is at the heart of searching for commands. And this is something we can actually demonstrate from a readability perspective. We first have an other com another command that will parse your script code, your script object, your script file into the AST object that represents the tokenized parse PowerShell script. And then we search for it by giving it this filter condition and every a object in the AST uh, tree structure has a specific type based on what kind of object it represents and all the commands are command ASTs. So we only want commands with that. And afterwards I match those commands to the splats that are being used in parameters. The class for the command token, which is a slight um, C sharp project. So there's a bit of more coding in here that I'm not going to run you through anymore. This is mostly data processing. All the AST magic happens here in the script code. This is a fairly common design decision for me that I put the object model into C sharp once the project gets complex and I need the object from the functional logic a bit more clearly separated to not get lost in the wood. In which case, uh, I built C sharp classes. I don't use PowerShell classes in almost any project, mostly due to the complexities um, with making sure all the types are there and the correct type. I don't want to have a conversion error converting the object uh, command token to the type command token. Factoring in the splatting and that is then a scan result. But fundamentally, what we're doing is uh, when we work with the AST, we try not to walk through individually. We give a filter condition. And then if you're looking at the command that I'm using for that, which is an exposed command, you can use the module just for the AST commands. All we really do is call the find all method with the filter condition. And in my case, that's some search result around that. Yeah, that's the ACE2 tool tooling that enables what at the end is a plugin that provides the functionality to either scan for items that match of that type and then to convert them to whatever we want to convert it or provide messages for whatever we want messages. Nothing more to add, confusion completed. Yeah, I think just super cool, super black magic, like somebody's just said, <laughs> yeah. So the, the, the beauty here, we were talking, uh, Phil and I were talking uh, offline while you were presenting here. The, the beauty is in the simplicity of the module that you wrote. And because you made it so simple, here's a script, pipe it to a command, get back what needs to be converted line by line, 
it doesn't make for much of a demo. So going in and, and diving deep into how you did all this work is really interesting. For the person that came here to just learn how to convert old scripts to new commandlets, they probably could have watched 10 minutes and said, okay, I have enough and I move on. But for the person that really wants to know the guts of how this all works and how you put it together and what was involved to do all the scanning, this has really been a really insightful demo that you've done here. Like I said, the, the, the module you created is so simple in nature, it unfortunately doesn't make for you having much to present. But that's the best part of the module, man. It, you don't need a, a science degree to figure out how to run the commandlets. So I really appreciate this deep dive. And very happy to correct about it. <clears throat> So, so it's like about four in the morning for Fred, and uh, I know he's a night owl, but at some point, he's got to go in before the sun comes up and he turns into, uh, you know, the vampire comes, gets and gets him. So we got to let him go here eventually. Uh, but is there any questions people have for Fred before we wrap up here? Anything that he went over tonight that didn't make sense or anything you might want to know about how the original module was created and what's coming down the future or what may be some insight he has as a Microsoft employee about direction. Now would be the time to get that in. If not, we're going to be wrapping up here. Um, I thought this was excellent tonight. And uh, I'm just going to go off on a tangent here. If you've been watching tonight and you've, you've made it this far, well, first, we, we appreciate you joining us. And if you haven't attended our group in the past and you're watching on YouTube, Check out our channel. We have about 100 videos that cover pretty much all aspects of PowerShell. And if you'd like to come and join us in person, we meet twice a month on Wednesday, the first and third Wednesday of the month. And you can join us online. Anybody can join us in a Teams meeting from around the world. And then you can join us in person and get to ask questions of our fabulous presenters. So we we'll hope you join us for the next one. Um, it doesn't look like we got any questions here other than Stevie telling me that I'm crazy for thinking that Fred actually goes to sleep sometimes. Uh, <laughs> Thanks for the word of confidence. <laughs> I think if we if we slice his wrist, that like motor oil is going to come out of something. <laughs> um, Fred, we certainly appreciate your time. Um, maybe we can wrap up the presentation here. If you want to stick around with us, Fred, we're going to be chatting for a little bit. Um, if you have to go, I understand it's late. Um, but we want to say thank you for presenting tonight. And uh, we'd like to thank everyone for coming and joining us. And if you're watching at home, thank you for sticking with us. We hope you enjoyed this. Um, anything you want to add before we wrap up, Fred? No, nothing really. Uh, but feel free to reach out to me either right now or... Um... Outside, you can also find me in the PowerShell communities or on Twitter. Anything I can help with, any questions about any of my toys, not just what we've seen today, I'm always happy to answer. Yeah, I think we're going to try to bring Fred back in the future and see if we can dust off his cobwebs and get him to talk about PS Framework. Um, if you haven't explored that module, that's another excellent module that Fred has created that just enables a ton of functionality to do other things with PowerShell. Um, so with that, we'll say thank you, and to everyone, we'll say good night, and we'll see you next time.